it's um, indeed a quite a quite an experience to do this differently because I like to be on stage actually. I like to look you in the eyes, um, all you friends and uh, customers and partners. So for me, it's it's harder to be away from you and for the social interaction. But um, therefore, I'm looking outside of the countryside, and um, it's better than nothing. But I would like to thank you for joining because this is a dramatic time we live in. Let's really trying times, and um, I really hope you're safe. And um, the good thing with this format is you can do this from home, and um, especially thinking of uh, our friends in, in Italy who are joining. Um, that must be a tough time, but also there are some glimmers of hope these days because I think the numbers in Italy, the new infection numbers go down over the last few days. Um, I'm most scared in, in, in New York, in the US, where we also have uh, friends and, and uh, family, that that is uh, really right now becoming the new hotspot for this. So we really hope you're safe and uh, you stay safe. And um, yeah, so that's uh, what we are mainly thinking about. So I could not do this presentation without talking about this major topic. I think the topic that will be with us for a while. So the world hasn't seen anything like this before. So there have been global pandemics, but nothing in the speed and dramatic impact at a global scale like COVID-19. So that's partly because we live in a very globalized world with flights going around the, the world you know, all the time. And we are so connected that, you know, whatever happens somewhere in China, a little bit later, is on the little island uh, in, the, in the Baltic Sea, and a little later is uh, in Italy and in the, in, in the US. So it's really a global world. And the sad part is we don't know yet when and how this will end and how we get through this. Um, but I'd like to talk about some of the hopeful aspects. So there are, there is reason for hope. And um, so that's what I'd like to focus on today, um, because there is something that we can learn from that. Um, first of all, we are all in this together. As I said, our friends in Italy really were the first ones here in Europe, before that in China. In the US right now, it looks like New York is the next epicenter of this uh, uh, pandemic. And it's really something that we can only solve together. And I think we are more together than ever before, because it really takes every one of us and there's nobody who's safe. If you're young, if you're old, there is no exception. All the businesses are affected. It's really the whole world at the same point in time. And that is something that is in a way new, it feels new, but it might, might not be, right? Because a global challenge that demands every one of us to immediately act to resolve this is something that we also said about global warming. Here, however, we feel it has to really happen right now because the exponential growth of the infections is something that, that spirals out of control very quickly. The second thing is the impossible doesn't seem impossible anymore. So who would have thought like a few months ago that you could shut down whole countries like Italy did first and, and um, parts of Germany and uh, the UK and many other countries now or that you can live without, you know, basically flights, that flying is something that doesn't happen anymore, or that schools close and, and you have the kids at home, or that suddenly tr $2 trillion are produced out of thin air uh, to protect the, the, the enterprise and the, and the people. So really right now, the impossible is possible. And we all learn at an incredible pace. So it's really something that is astonishing how quickly the world is changing, not just in a physical way, but more like in our idea of the world, what we understand, what we have to do. That is, um, I think, a hopeful thing. And digital media plays a very important role here. It's critical to really get this collective learning at a global scale up. And digital media does exactly that. So when something happens, when someone figures something out globally, we all will know it about it pretty quickly. Digital media really enables us as a global to, to learn quickly, to move much faster. And even if some countries make mistakes, there is a, a strong impact just a few days after because the society will say, no, we don't want this. This is wrong. We, we go the other way. 
screen use is up by 57% right yesterday. And um, that's, that's clear why, right? Because we are at home, we have to distance ourselves from our friends and family and partners and, and, and all that. And to be, however, not distant in, the, in an emotional way, we use screens. We use screens to connect to each other. I, for example, my, my dad, he has a cancer treatment, so I can't really go there right now. And that, that pains me. But I can, and the kids can FaceTime with him, and we can basically connect through the screen. And this the same is true for I think all the other families, also for our friends to not drive go insane when you're at home all the time. Um, so screens are really saving us. Also, screens they save us because they give us access to all the knowledge in the world. So this what I mentioned earlier, this collective learning that happens right now at a global scale is done through screens. So it's it's this kind of like um, you know to to distance ourselves from each other seem to be something social distancing that feels like maybe the wrong word because it's more like physical distancing or physical separation that we have to do but digital connection that we are still socially close but not in a physical way but in a different way like we do today here at, at the um, Comedia Connect. I believe that we are collectively smarter than ever before. So the globe really learns right now something at an uh, astonishing speed. And so therefore it might be even that we see there is a use case in Facebook and, and the like. They bring a lot of bad things, but social media connects us in a way that we learn together faster than ever before. At the same time, there's a huge threat. So what we see is that totalitarian systems seem to thrive, right? Like there's this question in this big threat upon us, do we really need to have a, a totalitarian system to tell us what to do, to basically take our uh, individual rights and just to basically implement stuff if people want it or not? It seemed like that is the way to go. Full kind of like uh, breakdown of, of privacy, full tracking of everyone, profiling and, and harsh uh, restrictions on people. That's what happened in China and that seemed to have worked. So when you look at the Chinese numbers, they used draconian measures and then they succeeded. So the number of infections all over China is, is massively down, I think close to zero. And um, that is, yeah, it's, it's impressive and partly hopeful that we can measure, ma manage this infection, but it's also scary because when that is our future, I'm not sure we want to really accept that so easily. So therefore, and what we also saw actually in, in China was at first, the government suppressed the news about the virus. So there were people who saw this problem coming and they, they blew the whistle and they tried to inform people and warn people and they got basically jailed and, and uh, at the end even died. So it is something that totalitarian governments do as well. They don't like openness. They don't like you know what we have in democracy. So that is also part of the story in, in China. So what I saw in the last few weeks is that democracy can cope better than we feared in the first place. It seemed like closing down a whole country is nothing we can do in an open society, but we can. Italy did it, and you know Germany basically did it for, for pretty far, not not as far as Italy, but many other places drastically changed the the um, society but not against the will of the people but with the you know support of the people so democracies can move quickly and that is a hopeful thought so they move faster than ever before and they don't do it by destroying all of our uh, individual rights so i don't think that we have proof yet that democracies can't survive in this new age where we have moved quickly we try new things at a massive scale. So who would have thought that, you know, keeping all the kids at home or working from home remotely, what we do at Chromedia, you know, is possible or so easily possible. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of these things that we try now will stay with us because they just work. We have this global collective learning. It's not just locally, it's really a global system. And I think we will learn something about how to beat COVID-19 that we then will use to beat, you know, to do have global collaboration for other um, uh, topics. So don't think that the solution for COVID-19 will be a solution by one country alone with the borders up. It will be a global solution with global collaboration. 
You know, what was good in this case was that China shared all the DNA or the RNA of the virus with uh, the, the world and people could start working on vaccines and tests right away. So that is global collaboration that, that gives me hope. I also believe that we will have fundamental change. So it's really a crisis that will not let us go back to the old status. We learned something about human, uh, mankind. We learned that we can achieve something amazing if we have to, or if we want to. So it's, it's amazing when we see right now what we can do, right? We didn't expect this to be possible. So the things we learn now with COVID-19, I think will help us also to master climate change because it's the same thing we need. We need global action. We need, you know, really dramatic action, like changing something and not just more of the same. I don't think we will go back after the crisis. So when this is over, I don't think we will have the old status quo. I think we have a changed world. Like one bold idea that I was, um, uh, I really expected to happen in the next crisis was universal basic income. That is very likely by now because I think in the US they already put it into law to have payments to all people living in the US multiple times, I think two times, um, three times. So we will come to this universal basic income as my perception. I think that's a good thing. Um, because that's something that our society might need in other areas as well, not just in this uh, crisis. We will have remote work being much more accepted. That's a good thing, I think. Digital business overall will be the norm. So right now, it's the only thing that is completely unlimited. You can, if you can do it digitally, there's no problem with your with your business. If you can't, you have a problem. So doing your business in a digital way will be the new standard. And I. Let's look at numbers and it looks like not just being digital, but mobile first will be the best strategy to go for. At first, people expected potentially that people at home use their computers, bigger screens. But the truth is the numbers that some sites publish show that the use is up overall, but it's more up in mobile than on screens. Because at, at home, we basically are using our iPads and iPhones more so than, than old computers. We will also see that escalating customer expectations will put tremendous pressure on organizations. That was true before the crisis with something like Amazon Prime, but now in this crisis, when you can't go shopping, when you basically should stay home, it is just kind of like uh, really powerful to get whatever you need with a click. It also means that all the companies who can't offer that will be in a massive problem afterwards. Well, I also see that superior customer experience will disrupt the markets. We could see that in the payment space here in, in Germany with, with N26. Right now, I'm so happy that I don't have to basically pay with cash because you know I try to avoid um, all the interactions, the physical interactions, and using my my uh, Apple Watch two clicks and pay at the at the register without touching anything except my own stuff is really something that that feels good. Then. But there, N26, I think they will have also a disruption in front of them with something like the Apple card, um, which is even easier to implement. It has no fees at all. So disruption will happen faster and faster. And I think we will also see that computer, consumer behavior will change faster than ever before. So our behavior right now, that's drastic, right? How we you know, are living in a different world, but we are behaving very differently than, than just a few days before. And that will be with us in the future, I think. We will see faster changes. Cash, I, I would predict that cash use will go down significantly after this crisis because cash feels dirty now and, and people are scared. But also, what I also see is that some brands use um, or are reacting in this crisis faster than others. So some really move at the speed of culture. And in this example that I for you is, is Nike. A little bit before the big crisis hit, um, Kobe Bryant died. And that was, you know, felt all over the US and, and globally because it was so unexpected and devastating. All the customers of Nike, or most of the customers of Nike, wanted to express their feelings. So the next day, Nike, you know, published this, but they might have even, like, you know, used their stores and turned their stores digitally into a memorial for. Now, in this crisis, Nike also reacted. So 
when you stay at home, when you have to stay at home, that is something that Nike stands behind, even though they are supporting sports and it's usually outside. So if you ever dreamed of playing for millions around the world, now is your chance. Play inside, play for the world. Another thing that we see happening in the future is that smart screens will further increase the velocity of, of learning and communication. So right now we can't go outside much. That will change and when you look around the world uh, at these, these places like New York or uh, Tokyo, they look like this, right? You have a lot of screens out there and the screens are digital. They are not physical anymore and they, you can update them and you see them in the stores everywhere. We'll see them all around us. And these screens are not like the old you know, times when you updated them once a quarter or half a year. They will be updated instantly and they will be more useful because you indeed start to communicate stuff that is relevant for your customers instantly. Plus voice will be key. Um, when I look at my children, especially when they're at home all the time, they use voice interactions with, with uh, the Apple HomePod all the time. They listen to podcasts, they play their music, they all the things, they send messages with that thing, so they switch on the light. So it's, for them, it's completely normal to have this, this way to interact with the world, to have a voice interaction. I think that will also be with us in the longer term. So what does it mean for you as an organization? So what we see happening is that to survive, companies must become agile, iconic. They have to stand for something and then implement that. And they have to be fast. Being faster is just always better. If you are faster, you spend less time, you spend less money, you have a faster time to learn. So you kind of like uh, are more efficient and you can be effective through the faster learning cycle. So that speed part is important. What we also see is that um, you have to master multi-experiences across touch points. So it will be more than in the past needed that your experiences can be used everywhere. I saw it in, in, in Germany with the German government being our customers. Um, they communicated and they have communicated a lot. Now they had to manage to reach every single person in Germany. So what we were saw happening was that the number of languages went up that have been produced. So the content is published in more and more languages because you want people to have the lowest hurdle to access that information. So in a way, managed content in all the different languages for all the different screens is something that is critical for all enterprises. So that's where Core Media sees our core, that we orchestrate these multi-experiences so that we bring the content into multiple touch points into your online store, your website, newsletters, apps, SEO, or social media, or even in, in, uh, uh, on screens that are in your enterprise or in your stores. So that's where we see Comedia Content Cloud shine. And you might have seen this over the years. This was, I think, you know, like two and a half years ago, where we show how we combine, you know, content, in this case, uh, product content with videos and uh, make them and shine on all these different uh, screens or bring content even into the inside of the store by connecting product content with the store screens. Then, you know, we brought this further. We are able to manage all that experience in a virtual world. So what if you as a brand manager can, can really go and look at how will my experience look like tomorrow morning when it's raining in Singapore? So the idea to really get, get control, full control over the experience wherever it happens. And last year at the DMX School in, here in Europe, we showed this year, 14 screens and full control of all the screens from one studio. Uh, Oli, who will present later on, uh, did this demonstration here with, with Florian. So really the idea that it must be very easy for uh, a marketer or a business user to orchestrate all these screens with, with content that is relevant for all the customers.